had an Old Testament history professor, W. W. E. Cassell, old Methodist preacher that uh, when he got very excited would spit, you know. And so once the students knew that, you never sat in the front row. <laughs> and so as we started out today, I was kind of wondering if I thought I was a spitter and everybody was sitting in the back. I, but I hope you know, it wasn't funny there, though. <laughs> it wasn't funny. Let's just pause for a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for our joy and privilege to be here and to come to know you aright. And as your word is open before us, may we indeed understand more and more your love for us. Bless your servant today as he presents these truths to the hearts of your children. May we profit by it. For Jesus' sake, amen. As you well know, there are some very tremendous passages in Scripture that uh, we all enjoy passages that we've come to really feed from um, whole chapters like the 23rd Psalm you know first um, Corinthians 13 others that we do and the same even with individual verses you know John 316 and in and, and others that we go through and you say my this is a precious gem this is a beautiful passage this one particular verse really stands out in my heart and mind. Uh, I'd like to take one of those verses today. And it's important to me because it's somewhat of a theme verse for our uh, independent board. Isaiah 45, 22. Um, before we look at that, I'd like to be able to um, share how this particular verse was important to a man uh, about 150 years ago. If you lived in England at that time, the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon would be quite familiar with you. You would know this man as uh, uh, the pastor of this church and uh, the great preacher that he was, uh, a tremendous man of God. He was born June 19th of 1834 and declared so many people probably the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul. A powerful man, a man with tremendous insight in the scriptures. His grandfather was a pastor of a small church, and actually the church only had four pastors in 200 years' time. Think of that. <laughs> maybe there was a Darth of pastors, you know, or maybe they just loved their pastors and they lived a full life. Uh, he came to um, spend a lot of time with his grandfather in his house. It was said that he learned to read, and it was a good reader by the age of seven spent many hours in his grandfather's library and also as other pastors would come into the house or other church people he sat in the discussions so from a very early age he heard much and he read much and his heart seemed to grow and was filled he came to know christ as a savior at the age of 16. two years later at 18 this teenager passed pastored his first congregation Two years after that, at the age of 20, he pastored a church which eventually became known as the Metropolitan Tabernacle. This church came from a small deteriorating congregation in South London to a congregation of thousands. The, the, uh, the tabernacle was eventually constructed to seat 6,000 people and Spurgeon filled that congregation. There were times that they said that people came to hear that you would have to get tickets two or three weeks ahead of time in order to hear him preach. There were times when he would even tell his own congregational members, would you stay home so visitors can come and hear the gospel message. October 19th of 1856, Spurgeon preached for the first time in the music hall of the Royal Surrey Gardens. The crowd was over 10,000 people at the time. The building is no longer there, um, but someone in the building shouted, fire! There was no fire, but the following ensuing panic 
uh, crushed people and, and as they ran out of the building, uh, I think it was something like seven or so had died. Uh, Spurgeon later said, perhaps never a soul went so near the burning furnace of insanity and yet came away unharmed. There was one occasion which he preached to a congregation or a crowd of 23,000 people without a microphone, without any form of amplification. 23,000 people. He started a college, trained pastors. Nearly 900 students were trained just during his lifetime, and that college continues today. By the time of his death in 1892, only at the age of 58, he had published more than 2,000 sermons, 49 volumes of commentaries, devotional guides, and a lot of other Christian literature. And I don't think there's an evangelical pastor today who doesn't have some works. Many Christians have some works by uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. During his lifetime, is it estimated that he had preached to some 10 million people. Well, you have to go back, I think, to find some of the truths in his life that really makes this important. Spurgeon tells of searching for God as a young boy in London. He said for five years he had wandered from place to place seeking somebody who would give him some spiritual direction. Yes, he had sat under his, his grandfather's library and he heard all the things that are going on, but he still struggled within his own soul. He said, I don't fear the wrath of God as much as he feared, as I feared it, the self, what it was taking. He wrote, if some preacher had told me to bear my back with 50 lashes and that would earn me eternal life, I would have instantly ripped off my shirt and gave him my back and told him, do your worst, spare not the rod, for it will bring peace to my troubled soul. If they had told me to run a hundred miles barefoot, I would have started off immediately if I could have gained eternal life. But to trust in Christ, rest upon his finished work, simply by faith to take hold of him, do nothing except believe and receive, this I knew not how to get a hold of. He knew the troubles of sin, he heard these things, but him personally to come and say, I can trust in Christ to relieve me of the burden of sin, he couldn't. In his book, Life and Work of Spurgeon, published in 1890, I'd like to read an account of his conversion. It's exciting. I sometimes think that I might have been in darkness and despair now, had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning when I was going off to the place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a court and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel there might have been a dozen or fifteen people. The minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. And a poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, went into the pulpit to preach. This poor man was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing else to say. The text was, can you guess? Look unto me, all, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but it did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in that text. He thus began, quote, and this is this preacher. My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now, that does not take a great deal of effort. It ain't lifting up a foot or a finger. It is just look. Well, a man need got not go to college to look. You may the, be the biggest fool, and you can look. A man not need to be worth a thousand years to look. Anyone can look. A child can look. But this is what the text says. Look unto me. 
many look to themselves. No use looking there. You'll never find comfort in yourselves. So, one, look to God the Father. No, look to him by and by. Jesus says, look unto me. When he had gotten about that length and managed to spin about 10 minutes or so, he was at the length of his tether. In other words, he preached all he could preach in that 10 minutes, you know. He says, then he looked at me up in the gallery, and he dared to say with so few present, he knew me as a stranger, and he said, young man, you look so miserable. And well, I did. But I had not been accustomed to having remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit. However, it was a good blow struck. He continued, And you will always be miserable, miserable in life, miserable in death, if you do not obey my text. But if you obey, now, this moment, you will be saved. Then he shouted at me, and he says, Young man, look to Jesus Christ, look now. And I did it. I did look to Jesus. I looked until I could have looked my eyes away. And in heaven, I will still enjoy unutterable. There was then the cloud gone. The darkness rolled away. In that moment, I saw the sun. I could have risen at that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them the precious blood of Christ and the simple faith which looks alone to him. Oh, that someone had told me before, look unto Christ and be saved. What a, what a testimony of the power of God. Well, this impromptu preacher at that primitive Methodist church on that winter morning was Robert England. He was a deacon. He had walked six miles to church that morning in the snow. Thank God that he preached and didn't say, well, I'm snowed in, you know. Or he could have preached, he says, on how to be up when the weather is down or how to glow in the snow. Thank God he preached on Isaiah 45, 22. One verse changed not only the life, but changed, I think, the world. Look unto me, the prophet wrote. Let's think about that for a minute. Look unto me. One, one look. Just one look can bring condemnation. We think back to the Garden of Eden, and when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise she took the fruit thereof and did eat and also gave it unto her husband with her and he did eat she looked one look she took and she offered to him and he looked and he took and history has been changed because of that Genesis 19.26, but when his wife looked back behind him, she became a pillar of salt. Lot's wife. That's all it took. Just one look to look back on the city and its consumption by the power of God, and she was changed. Earlier in Genesis, God warned them to not look back because she would become a salt lick in the desert. But just one look is all it took. And to be honest with you, she and her entire family wouldn't have been there if her husband had not stood up there on the top of the mountain with Abraham. And Abraham says, whatever way you want, you choose. And he looked and he saw the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of the pleasantries that were there. And that one look set within his heart. And even as he encamped, that one looked towards the city and the passage goes on, he grew closer and closer and closer until he was a part of that city. Joshua 7.21 When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them 
and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Achan, God's people were instructed, this city is mine and everything in there. None of it's to be touched. But Achan took one look. You know, and when you think of all of the years that they had spent in the wilderness wearing the same suit, you know, ladies, the same dress, you know, same sandals, only one pair of shoes, probably the same purse, you know, and they finally get to the city and there's the spoils. The victory had already come, but there's the spoils and there's some beautiful garments and silver and gold. It just took one look. God's people were instructed, but he lusted after he saw and he sinned. And it was that look, the lust of the eyes, that demanded that he go further. It was a slippery slope. Years ago, I had a roommate from Colorado, and during our one winter break, we went with him to his home, and he says, well, a bunch of us are going to go skiing. You want to come? never gone skiing before but sure we'll go and so he had clothes and we got up there and we got the skis and and got on the the lift and went all the way up to this thing you know and, and I got up there and I looked down and I got now you know just one look it was a slippery slope you know and you know I took the lift down and I took some riding from that time on but you know it was one look, and it was dangerous. You know, temptation is like that, like skiing. You can turn around all the way up until you just start down. But once you start down, you can't stop until you hit the bottom. Aiken knew that. You know, Lot's wife understood that. You know, Adam and Eve, once it started, the look was not wrong. But as the scripture, as we understand it, it's not the look. It's the lust that all of a sudden follows, that the look desires, and it enters in. And then eventually I find myself falling into whatever that attraction was. James says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Death. You know, my cousin... Has, has great ability. He built a company, you know, a hard worker, uh, just, uh, you know, he started a landscape company, and now he's got this huge company and all kinds of workers and all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and that was his bent. That was his desire, and he can do it. You know, we hear so much today about whatever you set your mind on, you can do it. One look, you know dangerous that can be. Lust, sin, death. The most dangerous form of LSD. And that's how it happened for David and the baby that died and the result among others. One look over that wall and there she was bathing. You know? How many other things have gone on in life? He could have turned away. Men are visual creatures. And Jesus said that we can commit adultery just in a look. So we have to set up the safeguards. Not just men, but everybody. There are those things that are laid before us with beginning with a look. And that doesn't mean we gouge our eyes out, you know. We put on blinders. But in our heart to be able to say where that sin begins, begins with a look. Job says in 31.1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I made a covenant with what I see, which in the eyes are connected to what? You know, the noodle, and that's connected all the way down to the short to the heart. You know, it's connected to everything. Job says, I've made a covenant, my eyes, what I look, and, and why should I look at that which is wrong? Why should I look at that which will eventually destroy? Men, we need to make covenants. 
some covenants, the television, the computer, the magazines, the co-workers, the neighbors, complete strangers for just one look can bring condemnation. Little kid song we do at VBS, be careful little eyes what you see. Careful little eyes what you see, for the Lord up above is looking down on us. Be careful little eyes what you see. One look can bring condemnation, but there is good news. Just one look can bring justification. The children of Israel in the wilderness were being judged for their sin as complainers and grumblers and the lack of faith that they had, and God sent serpents amongst them to bite. And in Numbers 21, 8, we read, But the Lord had Moses fashion a brass serpent on a pole to lift it up high, and only the people would look to that serpent, they would live. You know, when I first read that, I thought, you know, kind of silly, wasn't it? The brass serpent, but for all of the foolish things that they had done before, it wasn't really that silly, for they weren't looking to a serpent, but they were looking to what God had provided for their redemption, for their salvation in this particular case. The serpent was a picture of Jesus Christ lifted up for us. John 3:14, as Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. And as we look to him, our justification is found. The judge of all the earth slams down his gavel and he says, this one died for you and he now is justified. He paid that price. He paid that penalty. He gave his life for us. And all who look to Jesus can say, don't look to that pole. Don't look to Moses. Don't look back to the miracles of the Red Sea. Don't look for all of these other provisions that God had given, which were miracles in themselves. But they says, look unto the serpent on the cross, on that pole. So, so many today looking to the church, looking what Mama said, looking to some saint or to Mary, looking to their own morality, looking to their own sincerity. I am a sincere person. I sincerely believe these things, but they're not looking to Jesus. They're looking in the wrong directions instead of looking at him. We sing the words of the old hymn by Henry Jackson. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. For he alone is willing. For he alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. In our Sunday school this morning, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking. It's more than a glance. It's more than a, than a stare. But it becomes our heart's link to him. I look to him. I find my hope in him. I find my everything in him because he is my salvation. And nothing can take it away. That's my one look to Jesus. And it is a solid, firm look that I grow with. So we look and find one look to bring condemnation. We look, find one look to bring justification. But I also see in the scriptures where just one look can bring sanctification. In other words, my relationship with God is one thing, I'm saved. But what happens after that? Where is my growth? Matthew 17, 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Peter, James, and John, the inner circle among Jesus' disciples, were taken aside to the mountain. A special occasion that was made available to them, the transfiguration. And they saw, in other words, his glory lifted up, a shining moment as the sun. And these men were never the same after that. They took their eyes off of everything else except for Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah were also with him at that time, but they didn't say they saw Moses, which was the law. They didn't say that they saw Elijah, that was the prophets. They didn't say that they even saw each other, which were distractions. You know, it makes me think, keep my eyes off of people and keep them on the Lord. 
I pray for their country, and I think you do daily, whether we believe that whatever candidate or whatever position is taken is the right one or the wrong one, keep our eyes off of people. Keep our eyes on the Lord. I think that's great advice. Who are we following anyways? These two up in the mountains saw their goal. It was conformed in the image. It was Jesus Christ. They saw their challenge. They saw the truth. They saw the light. Just one look. In other words, they focused on him in life, and their lives were changed. They were different people. They were living epistles. They were living under the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were different men from that time on. Remember when Peter walked in the water and he began to sink? When he saw the winds and the waves that were around him? When his eyes were transfixed away from the Savior and, and they were looking at the troubles of life were around him and all of a sudden he started to sink? Ever happened to you? We leave Sunday and, and we're all encouraged by the preaching of the word and the fellowship and the singing and so forth. And, and we get back out into the world on Monday or Tuesday and all of a sudden something happens. And we start to see the waves crash. And we start to see the, the troubling and all, and all of a sudden my eyes are taken off of him. All of a sudden I don't see the, the, the one who has saved me and is changing my life. And all of a sudden we start to sink. These men, their lives were changed because they had a focus. I, you read of them later on, especially after the, after the resurrection, and they were different men. No longer cowards, no longer hiding in rooms, afraid of things. They boldly went forth and preached the gospel. They had been changed because their eyes were focused on one, just one look. What's the first thing you do in the morning? A little bit of mouthwash? Maybe your spouse would appreciate that. The coffee pot? The bathroom? Well, after all of that, what do you begin with? Psalm 5.3 says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. I begin the day in this sanctification process of starting by looking to him. Lord, I, I ask you to lead my path today and every day. And sometimes we find, you know, like I said, what do you do in the morning? The coffee pot. I start, set the coffee pot in the morning, you know, and it turns on at a certain time so it's ready for me. And we do things by habit. And a good habit is to begin by looking to him. We enter the day differently as I have my eyes focused on my Lord and Savior. Philippians 2.4 Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. All of a sudden, my eyes are in Christ, but I start to see not what's good for me or what's necessary for me and how can I gain, but what about him? What about her? What about them? All of a sudden, my sanctification process changes me to where I start to no longer see how can I, but how can I take care of them and what can I do for them? Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. We see the conditions around us, and sometimes we go, well, it's their own fault. They made those choices. You know? If they wouldn't have done this, if they would have been in church on Sunday, things would have been different. You know, Stuff like that. Jesus saw them says he was moved with the compassion because they fainted, scattered abroad, they had no shepherd. To see that, having compassion on those who are lost, that's what brings us out. John 4, 35, lift up your eyes and look into the fields, for they are white all ready to harvest. What does that mean? What is white grain? It's almost to the point of rotting. You know, it's up and then it's bent over and it's dropping down. Time to harvest is now, not another week. I have compassion, I see the needs that are there and look what God's done for me. I have that responsibility. The sanctification changes my eyesight. One look on the world around me says, they need the savior. Just one look. 
condemnation, justification, and finally glorification. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Looking forward to that day? See him as he is. The curse will be lifted. The power of temptation and sin will lose its grip. All sickness will be eliminated. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Disappointment, discouragement will evaporate. And all lust and greed and malice and jealousy and heartache will be gone forever. Think about these last days that we are living in. When we open up the computer or turn on the TV and see what's taking place. It is light years ahead. No, it's not. It's not light years ahead. Luke 21 and 28. And when these things began to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. These things, we, we talk about them all the time. When I first came to know Christ as my Savior, we saw, well, these are the end times. And, you know, I, well, the older I get, I said, these are the end times. You know, we, we keep saying it, but they are. They are. They continue to roll. Look up. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for it. I'm looking one look, one day to see him. One day to see them. You know, these, sometimes winter hasn't been real good, but sometimes you'll see those glorious sunsets and the golden skies and those rays shooting up like that. And you say, wow, this is bringing me great excitement. 2 Corinthians 4.18 While we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The blind man has to rely upon his senses to configure what's around him. He, he can smell, he can hear, sometimes those are accentuated in order that he can really draw pictures of what's there around him. But we who have sight, we rely so much on that. And yet the things that we see, they're gone. But the things that we don't see are eternal. The things that we talk about here, for the world, they're foolishness. One look in how that little church had, by the providence of God, brought that young man to sit there up in that balcony and to have this man within probably 15 minutes of his sermon say, young man, look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author, he started it, he sourced it. One look brings condemnation, but one look can bring justification and sanctification, and one day, glorification. How exciting that is. One look. Shall we pray? Father, we're privileged to have eyes to see, privileged to have eyes to look and to configure what we see. Is it right or wrong, or is it good, or is it evil? We're privileged to be able to see, and we can read, read your word and what you've done for us and how you have, you have provided for us eternal salvation that it is a work that not, we, we, not one can accomplish, not even the smallest effort, but it is a work that your son accomplished perfectly. And although, Lord, we don't see the cross and we don't see the empty tomb, our heart's eye knows by faith that it was a work perfectly accomplished and it was a work that continues to redeem today. We praise you for such a love as this, that you would save such a sinner as we and allow us to be part of your family and to provide for us an opportunity one day to look upon our Savior's face and rejoice forevermore. Father, purpose in our hearts not to look to evil, 
but to look for good, to find within your word truth, and strength, honesty, something that our lives can be built upon, and then find out that as we look to you, you can set us apart for your purpose. We can be sanctified. We can be guided by that. And Lord, one day to be with you. Thank you, Father. Seal these things upon our hearts. May Satan have no inroad in taking them away, even as the fowls of the air would pick up the seed. May we, Father, bury them in our hearts and find root and bring forth abundance of fruit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How about we take our hymnal for our final hymn today, number 606. I'd ask you to stand together as we sing.